Tom, uh, do you consider yourself any sort of uh, hacker? <laughs> you ever hacked anything? Uh, when I'm not gleaming the cube. Wait, was gleaming the cube <laughs> about hacking or was that about skateboarding? No. Oh, well, it was. Oh, uh, well, there's your answer. <laughs> was it? Oh, well, whatever. <laughs> when I'm not gleaming the cube, I'm also not hacking. <laughs> OK, well, I, uh, I I'd like to tell you about Sarah Anderson. Can I tell you about Sarah Anderson? Oh, that sounds matrixy. Yeah, go ahead. It is a little bit. She knows how to hack. She <laughs> has been ha trying to hack her anxiety. She knows that she needs exactly seven hours and 18 minutes of sleep and 20 to 30 minutes of journaling and 10 minutes of meditation every morning. She needs a vitamin B8 supplement that she says lightens the tightness in her chest and helps her sleep and she refuses cold food because it causes her to tense up while she limits caffeine alcohol and sugar oh this is would a you, different would you kind of hacking. call her i was wondering how you would take that if i call her a hacker what it could i possibly be talking about i've heard of the phrase life hacks or body mm. hacks is it involved any... oh, okay that's now the we're getting leaving the cube yeah we're great we're gleaming the cube. <laughs> we are biohacking. Okay. Biohacking today, Tom. If you are a biohacker, then you are, you're probably a Silicon Valley wonk, frankly. Right. And like 96% of the population of our fair country has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> biohacking is this kind of, it, it's this buzzword sort of practice that, that did start in Silicon Valley, California. And uh, it is... Uh, it's sort of loosely defined as experimenting on your own body and treating your body like a laboratory, Ugh. right? So everything from, you know, documenting and diagnosing how you feel when you eat less or more junk food mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe you might start microdosing on LSD or you've you talked know, about intermittent fasting before on the podcast. Intermittent fasting yeah. is a sort of a biohacking thing, but it can go all the way through people who actually have RFID or, or uh, like little magnetic chips embedded under their skin to help them get into, you know, secure facilities or get into their uh, car, for example, oh right? These, these little radio frequency implants yep. under their fingertips. That's always fun. Uh, but <laughs> it's always fun. <laughs> at, at it's, <laughs> and it's very, uh, it's very hard. Biohacking is all about trying to figure out what you need to do to integrate with the world to make you feel and function your very best. And this is where we talk about biohacking your moods. Mm, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So th if you're biohacking your moods, then you're doing all of the things that you think you need to do to change the way you feel at any given point in the day. And so you might uh, look at measuring your caffeine intake mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how your caffeine is impacting your mood throughout the day. For example, I might have uh, I, uh, been biohacking my own caffeine intake and discover that, in fact, I'm a hot mess if I have caffeine one minute after 1230 uh, I will struggle sleeping at night. Oh, it's that early for you. 1230. It's, it's PM. that early. Wow. Right. OK, yeah, exactly. And so I tend to unless there's something I need to stay awake for late in the evening, I'll limit my caffeine intake to early in the morning. Others are experiencing or, or experimenting, I should say, with CBD oil, right? CBD oil's mm -hmm. relationship to anxiety and ADHD uh, and starting to measure if you're biohacking, you are measuring your the impact of the substance on your life and you're keeping data and detail on how your your body and your moods react to it if you're just like into saying hey i use cbd then you're not biohacking just using it doesn't mean <laughs> doesn't mean you're you're, you're not a you, hipster you unless say it like you're that actually, right yeah hey, oh, i, I use, use cbd, CBD. <laughs> oh, yeah i keep it in my man bun exactly mm. Mm, would you like a gummy i have it right here <laughs> my hot pocket uh anyhow so you really are looking at these how about blue blocking glasses you look at blue blocking glasses you even know what that is well there was that old uh, ad like an infomercial about something something get the rockers that's when i wear my blue blockers does that sound familiar to anyone <laughs> i might really be aging myself right now i i think that it's a different thing i think I it is too know. okay let's go with I yours think it's a very different thing no we're dev and this is definitely staying in because somebody needs to look up what you're talking I about i promise it's, it was like these just weird fantastic. sunglasses that maybe were like super sunglasses but yeah and this guy got on and it was a testimonial and he did a rap about how he loves his blue blocker <laughs> Were they Revo? Were they Revo Stealths? Uh, I used to wear Revo Stealths. Did you? I had the they ones where you could also see behind you. Because <laughs> I'm a creep. <laughs> 
Okay, go ahead. Well, these are glasses that you might use to and, and start measuring your response when you use them in front of a computer screen. They block the blue light element that comes out of a computer screen. Oh. And it supposedly impacts your brain. You know, it keeps your that blue light keeps your brain stimulated, right? It's a stimulant. And so you want to reduce that if you're particularly toward the end of the day. Meditation and breath monitoring gadgets, right? Are you using an app to tell you how and when to meditate based on your experience meditating days before? Um, uh, supplements, those sorts of things. It is really great, this biohacking, if you're serious about it, in, in helping you to find a state of mindfulness. And that's that's kind of, again, a buzzword, uh, but it, it, it's a buzzword that applies to, to helping you feel calmer throughout the day. And we all need that. Right. The, the connection between biohacking and anxiety uh, really is all about making your brain feel like you're in a better space in the world right it's and using all that data that you're able to collect through you know documenting how often what you're eating when you're eating it and uh how long you sleep and you know what sensors you have under your skin uh you know all of that stuff to find your place of peace and i love that but the last and it's, and it's also advice, control I mean, it's it's oh, putting yeah. control totally. onto something, making it into whether it's officially science or not. I'm not sure. But yeah, but I mean, that's a way of really taking your emotions and trying to find real causes and effects. I understand it. I love that you say that it, whether it's real science or not. Let's be clear. Unless you are a scientist, right. it's not science. <laughs> You're just throwing crap on the wall. <laughs> no, every time I smile when I'm nervous, I'm a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> and I demand that people call me scientist Tommy. <laughs> there is a doctor, this Dr. Malouf, uh, who, who says that uh, he's a, a psychotherapist at Johns Hopkins, I believe. And he says that, uh, it, you know, the of all of this biohacking is great. You know, it's great. We're learning about all this kinds of stuff. But but really, uh, don't underestimate the power of human touch. That is the best kind of biohacking you can do. Have more friends. Hug more often, uh, you know, touch one another. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to say, don't be creepy about it. And uh, let's do a hashtag consent before touching. I'm going to go. Clearly... I'm going to do the other. I'm going to play the other side. I say get on a bus <laughs> and don't let anyone get off until you've hugged them and like s slipped a microchip in their bag or something like that. You are scientists. <laughs> get out there and do science. <laughs> Welcome to What's That Smell, a sometimes funny podcast about humans and their anxieties. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Tommy Metz III. And every week we each drag one of our deepest, darkest anxieties into the light to share it, learn about it. And hopefully laugh about it with all of you. I just did something different there. <laughs> Reach out to us. Send us the story of your anxieties. We want to hear from you because, as you know, we've been doing listener submissions all season long. Send us something to something stinky at what's that smell dot net. Hmm. Something stinky at what's that smell dot net backslash regrettable. And with that, <laughs> Pete, uh, I'll go first. Pete, you know what time it is. Hammer time? It is not hammer time, but it is time for one more visualizing exercise, Pete. Oh. oh this is good. But you really uh, want it to be hammer time? <laughs> <laughs> I can hear I it in your voice. Yeah. Uh, is it Morris Day and the time? Like you you kind of steamrolled over all of my time musical references. Whatever. That's okay. You go ahead. Okay. You do you. So it's time for a visualizing exercise. This is my second one and probably my last. Here we go, Pete. <laughs> Close your eyes, take a deep breath, and now imagine you're outside of your house. And, of course, you're barefoot, feet. <laughs> There's a construction zone nearby, but you're relaxed. And you look down at your feet. And on your right foot, can you see your right foot? I you, can. You, see, you see a small bump. It's probably nothing, right? It's cancer. No, Pete. It's smallpox jaundice. Uh, it's all the cancer in the world and you're going to lose that foot. But for now you're relaxed <laughs> and you look over at the construction zone and they seem like they're doing fine, right? They probably all have cancer. No, yeah. they just hit a gas main and now everything's on fire, Pete. They're on fire. <laughs> you're on fire. So you walk back to your house pretty jauntily because you're on fire, uh, but your house is gone, Pete. Where's my house? Oh, the IRS is foreclosed. It's still physically there, but the IRS is foreclosed on it. 
and your family is in the street. Oh, no, wait, now your house is on fire uh, and your family's on fire. And now we can open our eyes and we're back. Okay. Oh, Fe- was, do you feel better, Pete? Not a good exercise. Really? You are decidedly terrible at that. <laughs> I don't know, because it definitely leads in to what's coming next. Pete, I have a listener submission this week, and it's a good one. May I dive right in? I guess. Okay, here we go. The submission comes from Matt S., and he writes, Dear Tommy and Pete, I won't say frequently, but increasingly, I have found that if I can't nearly immediately reach someone who I feel or know I should be able to reach, my mind immediately goes to worst case scenarios. In extreme cases, I have full-blown nightmarish scenarios play out in my head about what terrible tragedy has just befallen the person I can't get a hold of. I'm going to be paraphrasing uh, the rest of his uh, email because it was very well written, but fairly biblical in length. I might still be reading it. Uh, But either way, um, as an example, he says a few months ago, he got home from afternoon carpool duties and he found the garage door open and his wife's car parked inside the garage, completely normal. But he couldn't find his wife inside or in the backyard. And when he tried to call her, she didn't answer her phone. Sidebar, turned out she had left her phone in her car. But anyways, While the rational part of him knew that she could be talking to her neighbor next door, he, quote, earnestly considered the possibility that someone had tailed my wife home and then nabbed her, thrown her in the back of a paneled van and Neeson style taken her. He says it really is irrational, but it's honestly something that I pondered. And these thoughts can affect my mood and actions. When this episode happened, I was internally upset with my wife for not taking her phone or letting me know exactly where she was. Of course, I never voiced that because by the time she got home, I had realized that in reality, the only reason I was really upset was because of this messed up vision that had entered in my head and my head only. So, Matt, what is this? I did some digging because I didn't exactly know what this would be called, this worst case scenario. And I think I came up with what our listener is talking about. And Pete, it's got a fantastic name. Is it Liam Nisophobia? It is not. <laughs> that would be even better. <laughs> no. Because I feel like we, well, I don't want to miss a step, but I sort of feel like we need Matt to catalog his unique set of skills. <laughs> what can he do that might help him build some confidence when he encounters this sort of a yes. scenario in the future? What He's is just he capable He's just constantly of? telling his family to get under the bed, that they're coming for them. <laughs> this is a cognitive distortion, and it is called catastrophic thinking. Or (gasps) catastrophizing. Oh, yeah. And it's real. And Matt, you are not alone by far. If you look up catastrophic thinking or catastrophizing, the internet is your oyster. I wouldn't look it up because it's such a a terrible topic. But thank you so much, first first and foremost, for writing in. And let me go through it. Catastrophizing is defined as worrying about and imagining worst case outcomes of situations. These negative fake scenarios are generally much more intense and graphic than what could ever be expected in reality. And they can be harmful. Uh, Clinical psychologist Joe Dilley wrote, catastrophic thinking is problematic because it triggers symptoms that involve the very outcome we are hoping isn't happening. For example, worrying that a pimple in a tumor activates some of the same brain regions and emotional apprehension that occurs when the bump actually turns out to be a tumor. So no, even just no, thinking no, about no, it, no, no, stop, no, catastrophic no. thinking spikes the stress hormone cortisol and reduces our ability to think and react effectively. Do you not know me? Have we not? Are you <laughs> Tom? What, what, what have I done? Crying out loud. What's wrong? Do you know how I respect you? Just What's thanks. <laughs> just thanks. Thanks a lot. Now, I, <laughs> God. Do you have smallpox now jaundice have in your foot? Right under my nose. And I think I might be having. Why is my left arm going to sleep? What yeah. have you just done to me? Don't worry. Don't worry. There's good <laughs> tips coming. <laughs> I have tips. Be- you are not credible. I am. Remember, I'm a scientist. <laughs> you have to believe in me. Now get back on the bus for a hug. <laughs> this is horrible. Yeah. Um, so real quick. Yeah, Tommy I- Handsome, the scientist. Get back on the vomit bus. Great. <laughs> 
I wanted to explain very briefly before I check in with you, because you seem to be doing great, Pete, uh, what psychologists think makes catastrophizing different than other anxieties. The primary difference between anxiety and catastrophizing is that anxiety can, as we've sort of talked about, can actually play a useful role in a person's life. Anxiety can be a positive emotion because it can help you be protective of yourself. However, catastrophizing does not usually have any benefits. It just fills a person's mind with unnecessary emotions that take time and thought away from the reality of a situation. So, Pete, after all of those words that I put right in a row, I wanted to check in with you. Do you suffer from catastrophic thinking? <laughs> I am not pleased with you today. <laughs> Why? That's, I'm also do not you know what this podcast Matt. is? Oh, okay. I feel like you just <laughs> you just manifested something new and I felt it and it hit me in the face. So tell me so what you're hard. going through. Tell me what you're going through. I no, I totally I I totally relate to this and mm-hmm. it's of course I do. Of course I do. That's mm-hmm. the whole point of what of of how I I mean the of panic attacks that I deal with is exactly this. <laughs> it's let me figure out. Hmm. Uh I, you want to talk to me about some sort of cardiac disorder? Immediately, I'm having a heart attack. Like that's just right. how I work, and yeah. So uh, I, I, I didn't need to hear that this is a thing, and I certainly didn't need to hear about my brain uh, parts. And <laughs> but what doesn't they, it make you feel make better my that pimple tumors that that's, it's so like, common that they've named it and gave it such a happy name like catastrophic thinking? Does that <laughs> what, not do what anything are they for thinking? you? <laughs> what are they thinking? <laughs> The Why other... would they do that? They should call it gentle thought syndrome. Come on. <laughs> well, I, too, have a version of this. Mine is more measured in that I don't do you know what I actually I call them daymares um, because they happen during the day, obviously, and they're not daydreams, obviously. So I call them daymares. I don't believe that something catastrophic has happened, but I definitely let my anxiety take very little information and really run with it. For instance, if I call or text someone and they don't hit me back at a time where I think they should, part of me worries not that they're in a van, but that I've somehow angered that person or I'm not yeah. important enough to them. And that's, I hope, never the case. <laughs> Listeners, do not write in if I'm incorrect. <laughs> uh, but I, that's usually never the case. People are busy or I forget. I mean, I'm losing whole swaths of my friends on Sundays during the day now. Because of football. I'm not watching oh, football. Yeah. I have You're no interest in football. football. But then, like, the world shuts down. And so when Why I text... Why aren't your friends still waiting for you? Yeah, exactly. When I text, I'm like, hey, what do you think about hats? And no one gets back to me for, like, three hours. I get it now. But it, it, during that time period, I'm like, oh, no. Either they're all at a party without me or... Uh, well, they are. It's called football. Or, uh, yeah, they just... They're doing other things. And so I definitely... While mine is not as doomsday scenario i definitely feel that i have this in my life i don't think i dealt with it um you know growing up or you know college right i think i i started dealing with it uh, more when i got married and had kids it's just it, mm-hmm. it it's just a thing that um that for me comes with those kind of i guess protective instincts sure and and then there was that stupid movie about the guy, and it was remade with Kiefer Sutherland. Oh, it was terrible. E- E.T. <clears throat> Kiefer Sutherland was not in. Why are you such a troll today? What are you doing? <laughs> you mean The Vanishing? Yes. Yes. I hate that. Tell, oh, the, tell the listeners about The Vanishing. It's just the worst. It's about just a random guy who says, you know what I think I could do? I think I could kidnap somebody and get away with it. I'm going to go ahead and do that from a gas station. Mm-hmm. I have not been able to like <laughs> go to gas stations since. Yeah. And I, I always think about that stupid for cocked a movie uh, when, when I have to get gas in my car. If you want to watch a better version of that movie that's different, but along the same lines, it's called Breakdown. Yeah. Uh, starring uh, Kurt Russell. So I assume you will not yes. put that at the top of your list. <laughs> no, it's not. I've, I've seen that one, too. Not not good. Not, not good. good. No, I'm not pleased with that because they also involve. Yeah, there's all this burial stuff. I'm just not keen on that. <laughs> it's Rocky really trunks. I'm just uh, it's it's your whole hit list. <laughs> it's all the things. Pete, yeah. remember, relax your barefoot. It's gentle thought syndrome. <laughs> gentle thought syndrome. So wh- why do you think people do this? I was able to find two examples of why people maybe why this is hardwired into them. Do you have any guesses about why or why you think you do it? 
Well, you you said hardwired, which makes me think that there's some sort of evolutionary purpose to it. And that seems terrible. Why would I want that? But I would immediately uh, say that it has something to do with the environment. Like it's environmental. Uh, it's a response to uh, a generalized stress in the environment that when things get more stressed in the world and we and there is more sense of uncertainty, then uh, it, it plays out for us in uh, a little bit more of an intimate uh, fashion. Am I close? I love that. No, that's not exactly what I have, but that's even better than what I have. So maybe oh. we should just go with you. <laughs> I looked up on www.u and I really figured, no. Um, uh, yeah, uh, obviously people might learn the habit of catastrophizing because they've had a really bad experience before that they didn't see coming. And so they think that in order to protect themselves in the future, they're already always looking out for worst possible scenarios. So they're not cut exactly, off again. Yeah. Obviously, that doesn't necessarily logically work or make sense. We can't predict the future, but I understand that other people catastrophize because that's what they've seen their parents do and they copy the uh, patterns of behavior yeah. that they saw growing up. I think a lot of people can relate to that, especially if you've had any nervous parents or anything. Um, so I have some tips that I was able to find. There's a lot of tips out online about catastrophizing or catastrophic thinking they all end in go see a doctor so i'm <laughs> so i'm taking that out of it if anything that we ever talk about of course on this uh, dumb podcast is so severe you should always uh go see a doctor right away why are you listening to us uh but i have some tips and i wanted to let you i wanted to ask you if you thought any of these would help okay i had a list of 20 i narrowed them down to three and then a little kicker at the end that i thought was kind of interesting all right. So number so one, 17 are totally useless. <laughs> 17 are <Tommy's> favorite three, <laughs> 17 are try a different doctor. Um, <laughs> number one, of course, number one with a bullet. You are not alone and do not criticize yourself. When I said we were hardwired, I overspoke. What I meant to say is that it's not anyone's fault that you catastrophize like everyone else. You're wired to catastrophize. Do you have that ability within you? Uh, and you wouldn't have been able to learn to do that and involuntarily sort of panic yourself. So it's not crazy. You're not a monster. It's just we have this situation in our brains. I get it. I think knowing that takes a little bit of the, I think some people can accidentally feel ghoulish about this when they oh, yeah. immediately think about the worst case scenario, especially involving others or loved ones. It's okay. Um, number two, realize that there could be value in catastrophic thinking. It needs to be managed, not discounted. Uh, That's what I need to hear more about. Tell yeah. me more about that. I will. Have you heard of the positive psychology movement, Pete? Tell me all about that. Okay. Well, Dr. Martin Seligman, who is the founder of the PPM, <laughs> posits that, <laughs> that, yeah, you know me, that there is often much to be learned from these persistent negative thoughts that may relate to old beliefs and core values that may drive emotional reactions and generate fear. Okay. That was a ton of words. I had to read it like three times. I think I understand what he's saying is, for instance, let's go to Matt's situation. Okay. What's really going on with these daymares? What's at the core of them? Are you really worried about your family's safety? If so, is it because do you find that some of your kids act in risky ways or risky behavior sometimes? Does your wife forget her cell phone a lot? Is there something that you can do to alleviate these core fears that... Really, the rational part of you isn't afraid that she's in a van, but the fact that maybe they have done things in the past to lead you to think that that is a possibility. Those are things that maybe you can address. Uh, I mean, it can go as severe as safety defense classes for your family if you're really worried about it. On the other side, of course, are you, <laughs> it was already brought up, are you perhaps watching too many Liam Neeson or vanishing movies. Probably. Is that Probably. is that really because I mean that's what Hollywood does best especially with thrillers or horrors they find the everyday and make it monstrous. I know a lot of friends that once they had their first or second child horror movies were just done. Yeah. Yeah. Any kind of horror movie, any children in peril thing was just done. If you need to do that, be be good to yourself and realize yeah. that maybe this genre which you used to love, maybe you're having trouble synthesizing that with now the fact that you have these people that you feel protective of well and, and the same goes for I, I would imagine uh you know apps on your phone right T take the notifications off or get rid of facebook you know stop scrolling the the feed mm. uh stop just if it's bad diving news into you mean because it's, it's all bad news come on it's all bad news eh, there's you know what i mean there's puppies on there i don't know 
Uh, it's puppies and bad news. I'll give you. Maybe it's puppies and bad news, but probably the puppies are in some sort of dire straits. Oh, I just checked. Yeah, all the puppies are on fire, and we're relaxed. Yeah, there, do you see? And, we're breathing. <laughs> <laughs> and then number three, it sounded like Matt was already coming up with rational evidence involving spotty cell service and friendly neighborhood visits. So he, mm-hmm. the rational part of him, knew what could really be happening, but. It wasn't doing the trick. So once you've already outlined the evidence of the contrary to your worst fears, turn that daymare into a daydream. As long as you're coming up with hypothetical situations, make it happy. It's called reversal. Instead, take a breath and come up with some of best case scenarios. Your wife isn't answering because she's too busy getting ready to jump out of a cake for you or something. (laughs) It's just as bizarre and unlikely as getting into a van. But again, if you're going to spin your wheels and spend time thinking about these situations, it's just as valuable, if not, of course, more so to treat yourself to what's a good situation that could be happening. Why not? Your kids, your kids are in the trunk of the car, but they chose to be there and they're doing their homework. Did exactly you, right that's perfect they're trunking that's what all the kids are doing these days it's <laughs> called trunking, trunking and they finish their homework and that's what they have bible study is in the trunk so that can really help retrain your mind practice that paradigm shift and it might help you rewire your thought process it takes it takes time but give it a try and then this is one that i found really interesting uh this was on a separate list all by itself it's by uh the author of the Cognitive Behavioral Workbook for Anxiety, his name is Dr. Bill Naus, K-N-A-U-S-S, and he actually says, <laughs> my, my way of saying it is, you can actually get addicted, unfortunately, to this catastrophic thinking. That oh, there I is a totally see that. catastrophic reward system is where you experience a subliminal relief from distress that reinforces the stress that it relieves. So that, again, was a bunch of talking, but basically you thinking of something that almost certainly can't be happening and then that not becoming true, you get a little flood of good feeling. But unfortunately, with that, you're rewarding that bad thinking. You're rewarding catastrophizing. you You get a little dopamine hit off of every time the universe proves that you're wrong this time. Exactly. And that can be really dangerous because with when you reward those kind of things, and this does get into hardwiring, you're rewarding those thoughts, they will come back and they will come back stronger. So it's very important. We talked about the idea of the paradigm shift and coming up with uh, either listening to listening and really believing in the evidence that is true or coming up with best case scenarios. Reward yourself. You have to make sure you reinforce your productive and not your dysfunctional reactions. And so he said that he was angry at his wife uh, because she didn't have her phone. Instead, one of the things that he can practice is, okay, it did turn out. Everything is fine. And she just didn't have her phone. It was just me. Great. Reward yourself for that. I didn't fly off the handle. I'm not angry that something was out of my control for a small amount of time. I held my cool. And once again, everything turned out great. Hopefully that, again, will rewire your brain in order to uh, reward the right things and not the wrong kind of thinking. So, again, thank you so much to Matt S. for writing in. We really appreciate it. And we hope at least some of this has helped you. Pete, what do you think about all that? Is any of that kind of helpful? I like some of that. Uh, You know, you tried. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. You try. (laughs) I did research, you jerk. I liked this stuff. My copy paste finger no. is exhausted. Uh, I no, you did great. You did great. Thank Let you. Just, I'll leave it at that. You did great. And I learned so much. And let's just say I have some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, do you, uh, you might not remember this. We went to college together. We did at a school. 
at a school. Yep. Uh, and and I just I have I've been sort of flooded with memories for some reason this week. And I, I just want to know if you remember this. We were in college and it was probably cram cram week or something. We we're studying hard. I don't know. I just remember, you know, uh, generally being in the library and probably drinking way too many refills of Coke in my giant refillable recycle mug. Do you remember yep. that? Sure. The plastic tumbler. Yep. Yeah. And and so I be and I knew that because I had a job at the Alfred Packer Grill. Mm -hmm. the, the only college restaurant, as far as I know, named after a notorious cannibal who <laughs> so, ate his family. So weird. And there were right? quotes. There's quotes from the judge saying that he's putting him to death, like right next to the yeah. salad bar. It's so weird. <laughs> it was so weird. Go buffs. So, so weird. Yeah, it was it was really per pitch perfect for an eatery. <laughs> and uh, and I remember it, sometimes I'd have to close up and I'd have to like leave the student center and I would have to jog down a bit of the little flagstone stairs to the sidewalk. And then uh, I just have this memory of not being able to move. Uh, and, and I was just stuck, like, to the sidewalk. You remember this? I was just stuck there. And then the, the doors would open behind me. And, and suddenly, like, my teachers were there, like, all of my teachers. And they were carrying books. What? And, yeah, you don't remember this? No. Like, it was like a parade of my own teachers carrying books. And it was so weird because then they started to beat me with the books. <laughs> okay. And they <laughs> they beat my... <laughs> no, they beat my head and face. And when I fell to the ground... Your head and your face me. beat. Pete! It might kick me and drop the books on me in this pile until it was so dark that I couldn't see. And I was suffocating and struggling and digging my fingers into the concrete, Tom. And oh. I was trying to get myself free. But as you know, I have a thing about being buried alive. And yeah. I, I just I'm really surprised that you don't remember this because it happened every single night uh, to the point that it would wake me up. <laughs> that is a harrowing nightmare. Oh, pretty, pretty good, right? I that was you very right good up until the, the beating about the head teachers don't generally do that. <laughs> well, not about the head and the face beat. Not both. They're uh, teachers. Not both. No, yeah. they are. They have, there are lines. Yeah, they know about leaving marks. Look. I've been thinking about this. Oh, in wow. Particular. And that would happen during cramp, like when you were super stressed about studying. Uh, right, right. Wow. Exactly. And, wow, and wow. so it, it, it got me thinking, you know, and, and, and there is this whole line that we've we've talked about. We've talked about night anxiety. We've talked about having difficulty sleeping. We've talked a lot about sleep. And that's that is a, a significant challenge. And in this case, you know, I, I've I have regaled you to my stories of of buried alive nightmares. I don't need to go into that again. Believe me, I won't. <laughs> Please don't. Right. Also for Believe our listeners. Believe me, after I can what hear... you've done to me already today, <laughs> I will oh. not be going down that road. Also, I checked right. your grave. It's on fire and we're relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> the worst. Uh, I, but, but I do, I'm, I'm part of another community, an online community for a, a, a particular podcast, and I, I watch uh, people who are are dealing with a, a particular relationship with their academic institution. And it got me thinking about why I struggle. And I look at my own kids who are uh, making a transition from, in one case, high school, uh, moving toward college and Ooh. middle school, moving toward high school. Oh, that's a big and one. When, oh, it's a big one. Yeah. And when anxiety strikes... Uh, around academic pressure, it can strike in significant and surprising ways. And that leads me to the anxiety that I have explored today. Are you ready for this? Yeah. I've heard of it. it is called scolionophobia, <laughs> the fear of school. Uh, oh, scolionophobia, the fear of school. Okay. Sure. Now, scolionophobia, uh, you think of scoliosis, which which is that's uh, what I was thinking. I actually yeah, when you said that subconsciously, I just realized I straightened up in my chair <laughs> <laughs> like that. That is such a primal version of that word. OK, go ahead. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting because scolio as a root is from the Greek meaning bent. And so the, the fact that this has been sort of co-opted into uh, huh. this particular phobia, scolio, scolionophobia, is, I, I think, interesting because I... Could I, it just I be that it kind of sounds like the word school? It, yeah, kind of. And, and we know so many of these phobias. I mean, this is a specific phobia. This is one of those phobias that, that I mean, it does exist, but it, and it's in one of the categories of the big five phobias, okay. right? right. And, and so, but, but all of these phobias are generally like, you know, they're, they're invented once enough people have you know show up 
Right. right. <laughs> we have them, right? I did one uh, about like face Facebookophobia or whatever that was called. It was a little exactly. on the nose. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so that's that's kind of where this is. So it's it, it may, I just like to think of it as it's you have a bent relationship with your academic institution and sure. remember it like that. Not a lot of people uh have this. Uh it, it is in terms of number of of students per 100 that are actually officially diagnosed with the phobia. Uh you're looking at roughly four kids in 100 uh for okay. elementary school three small but kids sizable right right three kids out of 100 in high school and one student out of 100 in college so really you know yeah uh, they're and all too that, high that's the only reason <laughs> <laughs> They're all too busy experimenting for the first time. So those are the statistics. This, what does it look like for yeah. people who have who who struggle with this? Now, in in my case, it led to night anxiety. Right, it, it mm-hmm. led to um, to struggles with all of that anxiety would come up, and it would keep me up at night. It would cause me to wake up out of dreams. It would it would keep me up at night, and uh, mm. and then it would lead to its own sort of cycle of ang- anxious behavior. Right. So when I'm at school during the day. I'm exhausted and I'm not oh. performing at my best. And when I get to nighttime again, <laughs> right. and this is what you see over and over again. You begin to develop an anxiety around the act of going to sleep because you know what awaits you. And yeah. it's probably Freddy Krueger, right? right? You've seen that movie, <laughs> like 19 different versions of it. Yeah. And it's it, there's you know what's there. It's terrible. So why would you want to go to sleep? And that leads to the self-perpetuating behavior. Right. Now, That's a spiral. It is a spiral. Because then you're performing worse at school, which makes you feel worse about going to bed, which makes you perform worse. Exactly. So tell me, Tom, have you ever experienced anything like this? I felt it a lot growing up throughout uh, junior high, high school and college. But I think this might be interesting. In the last two to three years, I've actually started when I'm having anxiety dreams. They are taking place in college. Back for some reason, that's what my mind has decided to take me back to in college. But mm-hmm. there's this one wrinkle. The thing that is normal is that it's an anxiety dream. I'm rushing towards a class. I don't exactly know where the class is. I do know that there's a huge test and I have not studied. I haven't been there in a while. So that's classic anxiety dream stuff. Yeah. The only maybe interesting part is that over the last two and three years, and I mean this, I could actually draw you a map. I've been creating a fake college, meaning like the plan, the layout of a fake college. Uh, Part of it is based lightly on Georgetown University, where my mom used to work and I would go visit her when I was uh, done with school. Part of it is uh, based on CU Boulder, go Buffs. And part of it, like there's a mountain and there's an in and out burger under it. But the point is I'm every night that I have this dream, I'm always looking for a different class and I go past all of the other places that I've already created. And then there's a new building. And it's been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm not kidding. I could draw you a map of it's now probably up to 15 to 16 buildings. I know the pathways. I know there's this library that I always go to the top of it and realize that there's no way to get across to what I need to. I have to go all the way down. So I don't know if that helps at all, but it is it's kind of fascinating. I wake up and I have both feelings of, oh, I'm relieved that I don't have to study or read ever again (laughs) because i'm an adult i can just listen to audible (laughs) but then also too kind of this appreciation of for some reason my mind is really creating this new environment and has been for like two years so you you have just unwittingly offered so much to this conversation you don't really know it and i have to commend you on your dope product placement Oh, about no. audible thanks oh that was that was well played that's sir. called organic marketing <laughs> listen this is a fascinating thing the scolianophobia and i'm gonna i'm gonna table what you just said for a moment and we're gonna come immediately back to it so uh, stand by we we know that scolianophobia is it's an irrational fear of going to school it probably comes from uh especially in younger kids and as it manifests it probably comes from exposure to stressful family problems conflicts in the family divorce that sort of a thing or it, it could be uh, from uh, harassment or bullying at school some experience at school that manifests in a in a broader fear of going to school uh fear of failure right fear of living up to parents expectations those sorts of fears feelings, um, you know, and generalized anxiety uh, issues, isolation, uh, 
you know, having social issues, not meeting enough friends, rejection uh, can lead to depression. All of that can then manifest in this scolionophobic kind of response. Right. And we have we have this whole like they tell you about your permanent record, like only when you're an adult, do you really realize how little so much of that meant and how important it was. But when you're in there, there's the whole system just like if you don't know how to write cursive. You're going to die. And it's like <laughs> cursive. What is cursive? No one cares about cursive anymore. But yeah, so I mean, all of that, it seems like the absolute most important thing in your life, especially when your hormones are telling you everything you're feeling is the most important thing in the world. Oh, exactly. Exactly. And it makes you not want to even think about school because the only thing you get when you think about school is anxiety about it. Right. When you when you and and it is such a a, a place of foundation for your life you spend so much time yeah. at the physical place that manifests such anxiety in you it, it is yeah. the same thing like i was talking about with that dream experience right and night anxiety you have to go to school therefore you are anxious about school leading up to school going to school and then you're it's just a self-perpetuating cycle that right of anxiety and so so how do you get through it and and this is what gets me back to your experience of building this mind school Hmm. Right? Mind school. This oh, I like that phrase. Yeah. So generally, you'll uh, you know you'll want to evaluate some cognitive therapy, some sort of cognitive behavioral therapy, and we've talked about this before. It's this whole idea of psychotherapy in which you you look at all of the negative experiences that you're having and you you attempt to challenge them and change them uh, so that this the, the stuff you don't want to be feeling is gone and you've replaced it with something new. Right. Sure. Yes. And in this case, using a tool that we're going to call a memory palace, right? This sort of mind Ooh. palace that you've developed, a memory palace yeah. is one way to condition yourself to actually expose yourself to the place, the school in your own mind without actually having to be there. Uh, like visualizing? That's right. That's right. Now, where did this whole thing come from? Just very briefly, and be- only because it's one of my favorite concepts in in therapy. Sure. Uh, Matteo Ricci. Have I told you about this guy, Matteo Ricci? The name sounds familiar. I might just like oh, it. You'll love him. He was a priest. Okay. Right? And he went to China to spread the word of God. And the Chinese said, we'll let you talk to our villages, uh, but in, in, you'll have to give us something in return. And so what Matteo Ricci brought uh, was a mnemonic tool called the Memory Palace. And it, it has been documented in this book uh, called the, the Memory Palace of Matteo Ricci. That is a fantastic book that talks about how he, he used uh, a palace in his mind that he built and, u- and used to store things that he had to remember. Like Sherlock. So, Exactly. Sherlock is doing this. Right. Right. So so what Matteo Ricci pioneered taking religion, taking Christianity to China, we're now seeing in Sherlock. That's the idea. (laughs) That's where it came from. Interesting. Right. Uh, You know who else? Uh, Another famous fictional character that does this is uh, Hannibal Lecter. Uh, If you've read. Oh, right. He doesn't need he doesn't need his drawings. Exactly. Because they're all there. That's where that is. So those are some of the fictional areas. In using this for exposure therapy, you're actually doing a sort of meditation where in your mind you're rebuilding the space that causes you anxiety and spending time there. And slowly but surely, you're acclimating to a better experience, the experience in your mind, uh, such that when you actually go to the physical location, you are uh, you're having a better experience there as well. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't sound like you bought it very well. well. Well, no, I guess that huh was because I was also thinking it sounds like my mind is also maybe taking care of me a bit. Yes. It's, it's putting a defensive me defensive mechanism, isn't it? Yeah, cuz I think part of me also kind of knows I'm not lucid dreaming at all. I'm not really in control. But I know that there's not a college with a mountain with an in and out under it. Like it's it's also using that time to do something creative while I'm still like skipping towards a, a class that i'm about to fail <laughs> I'm, also you could be architecting the best school of the future oh like that is more true. mountainous in and out burger right. uh, <laughs> for the win so that's one way to get through it the other you know you want to make sure that you're engaging in in a dialogue with your institution right you want to make sure that you tell your uh, in, your teachers, your instructors, your professors, that this is a thing that that you deal with and that there is a way uh, and that they need to be a part of the team in helping you get to the other side of it. That's their job. 
right? That's part of what they need to do, especially in elementary and middle school and high school. Um, you know, this this can be a thing that you can you, you can use just like you you'd get a plan for ADHD, you'd get a plan for, for those. You can you can get you can solve that using support systems that are that are in place. The whole bit of anxiety around learning things, uh, it, it's it it is a real thing for a small number of people, but I see it more and more uh, in folks because of the uncertainty of the education economy right now. The uncertainty oh. of the relevance of higher education, in particular, mm -hmm. the expense of the education economy, and it stresses people out. Sure, and I just uh, I just wanted to highlight that this is a real thing. And even if you have not been diagnosed as living with it, you may certainly have felt the anxiety uh, around it. And uh, so, you know, like anything else, it's important to uh, to talk it out, to work it out, to try to replace some of those feelings with uh, the negative feelings with positive feelings and find a community of those that you uh, can relate to, to get the kind of support that you need. You've already talked about the idea of reaching out to administration, to teachers, having them on your team if you're having this kind of anxiety. Knowing what you know now, is there something that you wish you could have told young Pete or even college Pete? I guess you really brought up uh, that it was college when you were having this problem. Is there something yeah, that we should right. be able to? I brought up the idea of that we slam, we cram permanent record, and this is the most important. And if you fail this spelling test, you're going to be out on the street too much. Uh, is there something that you wish we would tell young Pete or just young students anywhere to help with this kind of fear? Because school should be a place that feels good and safe and very challenging, but also like you're making yourself, you're creating yourself. Well, what's what's missing? Well, the thing that I feel like is and, and what I have told my own students is that this is, you know, the. The thing that you're doing at school is you're participating in a relationship and we both have responsibilities. The school has a responsibility to teach you stuff and and to make sure that we're delivering the the, the content that you need to know to to, de to develop a subject matter expertise that will allow you to develop a career or whatever in, in your future. And you have a responsibility to show up and to practice it, to study it, to practice the material, to ask lots of questions. If you do your part, then showing up to an exam is, you know, we we amp up the the our sort of sensitive sensitivity around exams and exam time that, oh, my gosh, it's just a, this is so terrible. An exam is not necessarily a terrible thing. An exam is simply a way for us to judge level of mastery. Like how much have you how much have you practiced the stuff that we've been talking about over the last three months? How right. much have you been able to digest it? That's what we're trying to measure. and. Uh, it is it, it has become a fear based economy, emotional economy, and it uh, doesn't have to be that it doesn't right. have to be that. I think we we overemphasize, um, you know, exam anxiety even today. And I think we're actually it actually strides. involves in catastrophic thinking. It, it does. Well, yeah. That's a great connection, too. And, and I think we're trying to turn that around when you look at, at universities that have have flipped the classroom. Right. These the institutions that are saying and, and uh, high schools, too, that have flipped the classroom that says you have unlimited access to all the information in the world. Right. Like you jump on the Internet and you can find right. the answers to any question I would ever be able to to offer you. I am no longer the best resource for you for content knowledge. Huh. Name the like. I'm not that resource anymore. I'm not that great. My job then is to give you the things that I think you should digest before you come to class. And when you come to class to create an experience that allows you to practice and develop and hone your skills in a way that is unique that you've never been able to do before. And, and that is a massive change in right. how we run schools. It is, in fact, it, it's much more sort of Socratic. Um, and, and so, you know, we're, we're kind of coming back in the, in a very, very large circle, uh, right. as we relearn how to teach, it doesn't have to be rote memorization. It is much more in demonstration. And I think if I could go back to myself in college and say, look, relax, man, this is not, this is not the end of the world. You're making right. it the end of the world because we're wired to do that, to make things bigger than they are, uh, a bigger deal than they are. Tests are always, you know, make or break. My career is over. If I don't get this, get this right. It, if I could tell myself anything, it would be relax. 
you've got you're going to be fine. Yeah. And I've been thinking I've been thinking, Tom, I think that maybe there is, you know, we're talking about all this, uh, this anxiety around school. And I think that we're missing a, a a real opportunity. You and me. Oh, what's that? I think we need to start a school. <gasps> the what's that smell university? Oh, yeah, my yeah, God. That's what I'm thinking. WTSU. <laughs> I like it. Okay. And we need so and, and like any good university does, they always start with the most important element, and that is branding. Right. So I think we need merch. Interesting. For this school. And and then we'll figure out if there are any good programs that we could read. That's we good. Deliver. Start with branding. And also yeah. let's all the anxiety dreams that people are gonna have, let's just yeah. bring them out for real. Yes. So there'll always be a test unannounced for a class you didn't take. We will constantly switch the classrooms around and everyone has to run to class naked. <laughs> <laughs> and we could just get all of those anxieties in the light and then yes. go to prison. Hooray. <laughs> and then the po and all of the all of the posters, like the library posters, they're all going to be like uh, the like a cat, hang the kitten hanging on the yep. thing that'll be like hang in there. But like its tail will be in a bear trap. Right, down below. and, it, like, and it'll it's be something really horrific. That's it's because we really want to <laughs> hang in there, baby, and the this. the yeah. branches on fire. Yeah, exactly. And then at the yeah. end of every school day, all the uh, all the students stick to the sidewalk, and all the teachers come out <laughs> and, and, teachers and, come beat out and beat them about the face and head. <laughs> <laughs> Another school day done. <laughs> Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash scent of a podcast. Over 180,001 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 player. It's fantastic. Tom, what do you got? Because we, uh, in Your Anxiety, talked about school and school anxiety, I listened to uh, a couple years ago on Audible a really touching book that I really enjoyed. It's called A Few Seconds of Radiant Film Strip, A Memoir of Seventh Grade. It's written by Kevin Brockmeyer, and it follows 12-year-old Kevin Kevin Brockmeyer over the course of a single school year as he sets out in search of himself. This book really kicked me in the brain in that there were times I had trouble relating to parts of it, but so many feelings and anxieties and happiness that it brought up of when I was in seventh grade. It was like it was just a mimeograph of my brain. And I'm old enough that I say words like mimeograph. <laughs> He just alienated a lot of people. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I would read it down by the soda shop. Um, it <laughs> is really beautiful. It's narrated by Kirby Hayborn, and it's, oh, how about this? It's only six hours and nine minutes long. So for once, keep your job, everybody. See your family. For you, the listeners of What's That Smell, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Again, visit audibletrial.com slash scent of a podcast. And guys, we're getting to the end of season two. It's not here yet, but it's going to be here right around the corner. And so you know what? It is time to share it with people. Uh, because we're going to be taking a little bit of a break after next episode. And so now is the time to really get people interested. Give us a review, please, or share it with someone, please. Now is the time to make this as big as that old jerk Mark Maron. What does he have? A garage and cats? No one likes him. Tell people to listen to us. And we really appreciate it. Coming up next week. Did you use this milk on your smoothie this morning? Was it any good? Sun. Distant. I'm pooping! <laughs> <laughs> Every local shop I came across in all of these dead ends had a dark shop, and the only thing that was lit up were these bird masks staring at me, saying, you're going to die here. <laughs> <laughs> and then the guy from I'm Just a Bill, the schoolhouse rock, comes out and starts singing to me in my head about what a fool I am for not being able to ride the damn train. This week's tune has been so clear by Ayal Raz. Cool name. Thank you all so much for listening once again. I'm Tommy Mess the Third. And I'm Pete Wright. And we'll be back next week on What's, What's that, smell? that Smell? The difference is the same. The colors always change. But the song is the same now. In tune, lifting us higher. Thank you.
tell you what I'm thinking, this shall come to pass. My name is Geek, I put them on as a shocker. Man, I love these blue blockers. Everything is clear, they block out the sun. Oh yeah, I gotta get me some. Everything is groovy, now I'm the bull in my speech. This is what I do up and down Venice Beach. My name is Geek, I'm more than a hip hopper. And I'll be cheap if my blue blockers, yeah. Now, what do I mean? Yeah, these sunglasses are really, really keen. So there you have it, folks, out there in TV land. Get you some glasses that sweep in the land. Remember what I said, now I'm a hip hopper, yeah. Go we'll get you some blue blockers, hmm. Now, yep, it's week. I'll see you later, I gotta make some money on the beach.